Number 15. Japanese Bird People You'll come across a curious sight when you take a virtual stroll using Street View near Tamagawa Josui Station in Tokyo, Japan. There, you'll find eight individuals, each wearing distinctive, identical pigeon masks. It's as if they are silently observing your every move, almost ushering you to continue on your journey and immerse yourself further into the area's intriguing surroundings. A few clicks forward, past the mysterious group, and a sense of unease washes over you. As you turn your virtual self around, you see the group of eight have turned to watch you walk away. The Japanese bird people achieved overnight virality when first discovered on Google Street View 10 years ago. Reddit users flocked to the platform to discuss various theories, from cults to a guerrilla marketing attempt by the makers of Hatiful Boyfriend, in which all the characters other than the protagonist are birds. Eventually, writers from the Japanese comedy website Daily Portal Z came forward to claim responsibility for the prank. They had heard about a Street View camera scheduled to capture the area near Mataka Station and, seizing the opportunity, decided to surprise the camera by wearing pigeon masks, a prop they had been using for their amusing photo sessions around the city. Number 14. Blood Lake in 2001, with a goal of bringing the marvels of global exploration to the fingertips of the masses' reach, Google introduced Google Earth. This revolutionary tool presented a three-dimensional representation of our planet, made possible by state-of-the-art satellite imagery. Over the years, the technology behind virtual exploration has seen tremendous advancement. Today's satellite imagery doesn't just map our world, it paints a picture in breathtaking detail, allowing users to zoom into the Earth's vast intricacies and witness its most remote areas. While Google Maps offers a street view feature, allowing ground-level exploration, Google Earth gives users a bird's-eye perspective. This top-down viewpoint has proved invaluable in identifying a myriad of strange and often inexplicable occurrences from all over the globe. Devoted users with a penchant for discovery have unearthed countless mysterious sites. Among these is a peculiar location in Iraq. There's a lake just on the outskirts of Sadr City, a suburb of Baghdad. What caught netizens' attention and led to its virality was the lake's uncanny blood-red hue. The glaring crimson stands in stark contrast to the surrounding environment, with the nearby urban sprawl appearing muted by comparison and other nearby bodies of water retaining their natural blue tint. The sight of this crimson lake has raised eerie speculation. Could it be that the redness is due to the presence of blood? Since the bird's eye view of the lake was first discussed online in 2007, there's been ongoing debate and speculation about the origins of this enigmatic and somewhat unsettling phenomenon. Some believe local butchers might be dumping animal blood and remnants into the reservoir, although researchers argue that to taint such a large water body, a truly massive amount of blood would be needed. Moreover, if the lake were filled with pure blood, the water would have a more distinct brownish hue. While chemical pollution is a suspected cause, others postulate that the redness could be due to elevated salt levels, known in some instances to turn water red. Another plausible theory is the presence of an algal bloom, which can drastically alter the color of water bodies. To this day, we still have no conclusive answer as to what turned the waters red, and all we have are screenshots of this bizarre incident that baffled scientists and the internet. Number 13. The Nancy Alien In 2010, the burgeoning internet community stumbled upon a perplexing figure on Google Maps. Nestled in the quaint lanes of 8 Rue Dr. Grandjean, Nancy, France, there stood a figure that no one could quite identify. To some, this seemingly elongated silhouette resembled the extraterrestrial beings from pop culture, leading to excited claims that the Street View cameras caught an alien on digital film. Meanwhile, skeptics and rationalists posited that it was probably an intriguing piece of art, a humanoid sculpture, or just a simple glitch in the image. Despite the ease with which such anomalies could be manipulated using tools like Photoshop, even in 2010, the authentic appearance of the image was hard to disregard. 
People everywhere, from casual browsers to dedicated netizens, flock to forums and discussion boards, inundating them with questions about the mystifying figure. By December 2011, the internet was ablaze with chatter. Every corner of the web echoed with the same question, what is this entity on Google Maps? But as people dug deeper, they noticed something even more bewildering. Screenshots began to circulate, capturing the live transformation of the once clear image. The alien figure was being blurred out, a phenomenon that seemed to be experienced universally. This raised eyebrows and piqued even more interest. If, as many thought, it was just a sculpture or an innocent glitch, why was Google, the tech behemoth, censoring it? The plot thickened further when, in 2016, Google took a more drastic step. Instead of merely blurring the figure, the entire building from which this entity seemed to emerge was now obscured. Curiously, every other structure on the street remained visible. This decision to obfuscate an entire building, from all angles and perspectives, spurred a fresh wave of questions. What was Google trying to hide? Was the alien figure more than just an optical illusion, or a work of art? And why take such an extreme measure for a supposedly innocuous anomaly? These questions remain largely unanswered. While some point out that it's a routine practice for Google to respect privacy requests and censor specific buildings, the history and peculiar nature of this particular case make it stand out. Today, 8 Rue Dr. Grandjean remains an enigma, a modern urban legend. Whether it was a prank, a piece of artwork, a genuine entity, or just another digital glitch, the Nancy alien remains one of the internet's unsolved mysteries, continuing to pique the curiosity of netizens around the globe. Number 12. Step Geoglyphs High above Kazakhstan, Google Earth unveiled an age-old secret etched on the terrain below. This is a mystery rooted in ancient history intertwined with modern technology. Here, on the northern steppe, colossal earthworks materialize in the form of squares, crosses, lines, and rings that span across miles. But the true magnitude and design of these structures, known as the steppe geoglyphs, are recognizable only from an aerial view. Estimated to be up to over 8,000 years old, these formations predate many famous ancient landmarks. First discovered in 2007 by amateur archaeologist Dimitri Day using Google Earth, these mysterious geoglyphs have puzzled experts and amateur enthusiasts alike. Day's initial discovery revealed intriguing shapes, reminiscent of crop circles, squares, and more. In the subsequent years, the tally of these geoglyphs has increased to around 260, with each discovery adding to the complexity of their origins and purposes. To gain better insight into these puzzling formations, NASA turned its gaze towards them. Utilizing space-age technology and imagery from satellite contractor Digital Globe, NASA captured detailed photographs of these geoglyphs. Such was the significance and curiosity around these glyphs that even astronauts aboard the International Space Station were assigned the task of photographing the region. Dr. Compton J. Tucker, a senior NASA scientist, found these geoglyphs truly remarkable. Expressing his amazement, he remarked, I've never seen anything like this. These mysterious geoglyphs have puzzled experts and amateur enthusiasts alike. The intrigue deepened as these discoveries challenged conventional archaeological narratives. At the time these glyphs were estimated to have been constructed, the region was primarily inhabited by nomadic Stone Age tribes. The sheer complexity and size of these geoglyphs seem to surpass the known capabilities of such communities. Given the glyphs' age, archaeologists and scientists grapple with a series of questions. Who were the people behind these designs? What tools and methods did they employ to construct these large-scale structures? Were these geoglyphs designed for art, communication, rituals, or perhaps a blend of all three? Some theorize that these structures served as horizontal observatories to monitor the movements of the sun. To this date, excavations into a few of the structures have not revealed any buried remains or artifacts, so it remains unclear how they were constructed. The interest in these geoglyphs has surged over the years. After their formal introduction, at an archaeological conference, these glyphs have garnered global attention, especially since some initially feared it was all a hoax due to the structure's incredible scale and complexity. The steppe geoglyphs of Kazakhstan serve as a testament to humanity's ancient past. 
urging us to reevaluate our understanding of early civilizations and their capabilities. Their very existence challenges our perceptions and pushes us to explore beyond the known boundaries of ancient human achievements. Number 11. The Merry Man Nestled within the arid expanse of Australia's outback lies an enigma of epic proportions. This is the Merry Man, the world's largest geoglyph depicting an aboriginal man poised with a throwing stick, seemingly on a hunt for birds or wallabies. What makes this enormous figure truly fascinating isn't just its sheer size, it's visible from space, but the mystery surrounding its origin and creator, a puzzle that remains unsolved over 22 years after its discovery. Located about 60 kilometers west of the tiny township of Marie in South Australia, this vast geoglyph sprawls over a plateau of otherwise barren terrain. The discovery of this colossus was as surprising as its very existence. Trevor Wright, a charter pilot, was navigating between Marais and Cooper Pedy on June 26, 1998, when he stumbled upon the colossal figure imprinted on the earth below. The scale of the Merry Man is awe-inspiring. Standing at 4.2 kilometers tall, it encompasses an area with a perimeter of 15 by 28 kilometers. At its inception, the outline was a profound 30 centimeters deep and stretched up to 35 meters wide. Experts, using the evidence at hand, conjectured that the figure was likely sculpted with a bulldozer over several weeks. Yet, no artist stepped forward, and no visible clues offered further hints. A solitary track marked the entrance and exit from the figure, devoid of footprints or tire impressions. The police, despite rigorous investigations, were left puzzled. Intriguingly, shortly after its discovery, anonymous press releases were received by Australian media. Certain peculiarities in these notes hinted at a non-Australian origin. Measurements were in the imperial system, a departure from Australia's use of the metric. The terminology used was also uncharacteristic of Australian parlance. Further deepening the mystery, a pit nearby the site housed an eclectic collection of items. A satellite photo of the geoglyph, a jar with a US flag, and a cryptic note alluding to the Branch Davidians, a cult from Texas known for a tragic standoff in 1993. A few months later, in January 1999, another clue surfaced near the figure's nose. A plaque bearing an American flag, the Olympic rings, and a quote from H. H. Finlayson's The Red Center was discovered. The excerpt paints a vivid picture of wallaby hunting using traditional throwing sticks, accompanied by illustrations reminiscent of the Mari Man. There is debate over whether these clues point towards the creator of the geoglyph or if they were deliberately placed to obfuscate the truth. As with any mystery, theories have abounded. The locals of Marais, a town with merely 60 inhabitants, were rife with speculation. A popular theory suggests that the geoglyph was a publicity stunt orchestrated by a scenic flight operator to bolster tourism. This idea held water as charter flights in the region surged due to a sudden influx of tourists eager for a glimpse of the mysterious figure. Extraterrestrials, warnings to politicians, and other elaborate theories made the rounds. Yet, the most plausible theory pointed towards Bardius Goldberg, an Australian artist known for his ambition to craft a space-visible artwork. Intriguingly, when probed about the Mari Man, Goldberg remained evasive, neither confirming nor denying his involvement. His subsequent death has left this theory dangling in uncertainty. While still shrouded in mystery, the Mari Man swiftly became an emblem of South Australia, beckoning countless tourists. However, nature's inexorable touch meant the geoglyph has gradually been fading. Locals realized that the site, restricted from public access, due to its location on native tidal lands, was eroding, and soon the iconic figure was at risk of vanishing altogether. By 2013, NASA confirmed the diminishing visibility of the geoglyph through imagery from the Landsat 8. This revelation galvanized the local community. A concerted five-day restoration effort employed GPS-guided machinery to etch wind grooves into the figure, the hope that nature, once responsible for its erasure, might aid in its preservation, filling the grooves with vegetation. Today, the Mari Man still stands, not just as a testament to the artistic audacity of its creator, 
but as a symbol of Australia's rich cultural landscape and the enduring allure of unsolved mysteries. Number 10. Band of Holes In the Pisco Valley of Peru, a baffling archaeological wonder stretches across a hillside, a long, sinuous arrangement of thousands of shallow pits. This mystifying configuration, which spans roughly 1,500 meters, is called by many names Monte Sierpe, Serpent Mountain, Chero Viruela, Smallpox Hill, and the most widely recognized title, Band of Holes. Despite its intriguing appearance, the site's true purpose has mystified scholars and remains a subject of much speculation. The world was first introduced to the Band of Holes in the 1930s when aviator Robert Shippey showcased an aerial photograph of the site in National Geographic. However, this initial revelation did not spur significant archaeological exploration. It wasn't until 1953 that Victor Wolfgang von Hagen, an American explorer, assessed the area and surmised the pits were empty graves, estimating a staggering 5,000 of these graves across the landscape. In 1984, archaeologist John Hyslop proposed in his book The Inca Road System that these cavities might have functioned as storage units. Mirroring this hypothesis, structures akin to the Band of Holes were identified at Quebrada de la Vaca and Tambo, Colorado, also in Peru. The pits vary in their construction. Some are simple dugouts, approximately 3 feet in diameter and 20 to 40 inches deep, while others are intricate stone formations on the ground surface. Intriguingly, the band is segmented into distinct clusters, each showcasing unique hole patterns. Fast forward to 2015, when a comprehensive analysis was spearheaded by archaeologists from the University of California. Utilizing drone technology, they meticulously mapped the site and deduced it featured between 5,000 to 6,000 depressions. While direct evidence linking the band of holes to the Inca Empire was not found, the proximity of an Inca road, Inca period storage houses, and Inca era pottery nearby hinted at a possible connection. This led to the presumption that the Band of Holes might have originated in the 15th century, after the Inca Empire's takeover of the Chincha people. Charles Stanish, a leading authority on Andean cultures, posited an intriguing theory. These holes might have been devised to measure and produce tributes for the Inca kings. The site's close vicinity, four miles, to Tambo, Colorado, a colossal 15th century Inca administrative hub, lends credence to this theory. In Stanish's perspective, each cluster of holes might represent different tax-paying extended families or alis. He visualizes a scene wherein each group would present their tribute, possibly produce, for measurement and tallying before dispatching it to major centers like Tambo, Colorado. However, a glaring question arises. Why is this unique tribute measuring system exclusive to the sites at which they've been found and not ubiquitous throughout the remainder of the vast Inca Empire? Stanish believes the answer may lie in the empire's decentralized nature, allowing for regional autonomy. The Band of Holes might be a Pisco Valley-specific solution to tribute measurement. Yet, this theory is not without its challengers. Jean-Pierre Protzen, an expert in Inca architecture, feels the timeline doesn't match. He suggests that the Band of Holes could predate Tambo, Colorado, and might have served as storage for guano, a coveted fertilizer. The Band of Holes remains one of Peru's most captivating archaeological riddles. Whether a tribute measurement system, a storage area, or something entirely different, its presence is a testament to the rich, multifaceted history of the region, prompting us to explore, question, and marvel at the civilizations of ages past. Number 9. Anonymous If you take a virtual walk on the beachfront of Orla Laguna do Pilar, you'll be stopped in your tracks by an intriguing instance of potential digital subversion. Instead of the usual imagery of streets and surroundings, you would stumble upon the iconic V for Vendetta mask, widely associated with the hacker group Anonymous. Typically, Google Street View images are captured using specialized vehicles, but occasionally, individuals with 360-degree cameras are employed for the task. In this particular set of images, where one would expect to see the shadow of the person capturing the imagery, there was a consistent appearance of the anonymous mask. With little information on the phenomenon, and with few people having stumbled across this enigma, we will have to watch this space to see if this mysterious tale 
has an ending. Number 8. El Bronx Navigating the streets of many urban areas worldwide poses its own unique set of challenges, but driving through the treacherous lanes of El Bronx in Bogota would be an ordeal of a different magnitude for vehicles like the Google Street View car. The prominent branding and high-tech equipment of the Street View car wouldn't just capture panoramic images, but could inadvertently draw unwanted attention. In an area where unfamiliarity often breeds suspicion, the distinct appearance of such a vehicle could be seen as an invasive presence making its journey not only perilous, but potentially life-threatening for the driver. Bogota's El Bronx was not just another impoverished neighborhood. This region, nestled between the dilapidated structures of the Los Martires district, has been described as a cauldron of crime and inhumanity controlled by a notorious gang known as the Sayayins. The activities said to take place within these walls are so monstrous that it would lead any onlooker to believe that they had stumbled upon a version of hell on Earth. The horrific tales began to unfold in the port city of Buenaventura in 2014. Abandoned homes in this city were discovered to have been converted into and dismemberment chambers by the neo-paramilitary group Los Urabeños. The victims' remains were then disposed of in the Pacific Ocean. This grisly practice made headlines again in 2015 when Medellin's police found evidence of similar horror homes, both within government-funded housing projects and abandoned downtown warehouses. However, it was the May 2016 raid on El Bronx in Bogota that brought to light the full extent of the horrors conducted by gangs in Colombia. Inside the houses of El Bronx, bullet holes and human blood stains testified to the unspeakable acts that took place within. Unlike gangs operating in places like Buenaventura and Medellin, the gang in Bogota did not have easy access to a river to dispose of their victims. Instead, they had dogs, caimans, and barrels of acid, all of which have been used for the gruesome purpose of concealing the evidence of numerous murders. A lack of bodies means that many of these homicides go unreported. The squalor of El Bronx was all-encompassing. Amidst the stench of urine and rot, there were bars where children were sold for broken bottles, smashed jukeboxes, and abandoned establishments bore silent witness to the unchecked depravity that ran rife. Informants, risking their lives, had confirmed that many had vanished within the Bronx, their existence eradicated without a trace. A month after the 2016 raid, the streets of El Bronx transformed into the most extensive crime scene Bogota has ever witnessed. From rooms to satanic rituals involving desiccated snakes, the evidence of the horrors was vast and damning. Yet, among all the darkness, there's a glimmer of hope. Almost 1,900 survivors of El Bronx are now undergoing rehabilitation in community centers across Bogota. Their resilience serves as a testament to the human spirit's ability to find hope even in the direst of circumstances. Number 7. The Village of the Dead Dolls Deep in the heart of Japan's Shikoku Island, within the winding valleys of Tokushima Prefecture, lies a village that blurs the lines between reality and imagination. Nagoro, Village of the Dolls. The tale of Nagoro is as much about its dwindling human populace as it is about the growing number of its doll inhabitants. As the years rolled by, many of Nagoro's original residents either succumbed to the sands of time or sought greener pastures in bustling cities, leaving behind a silence that echoed through the once bustling village. It was amidst this quietude that Tsukimi Ayano, an elderly woman who had spent many years away from her home of origin, returned to Nagoro. Distressed by the palpable loneliness and the void left by the departed villagers, Ayano embarked on an unprecedented artistic endeavor, drawing inspiration from the traditional Japanese kakashi, or scarecrows. She started crafting life-size dolls using straw and worn-out clothes. However, unlike the traditional scarecrow that keeps birds at bay, Ayano's dolls were meant to combat the engulfing loneliness of the village. Each meticulously crafted figure, positioned in various corners of the village, mirrors a bygone resident, commemorating their existence. As you walk, or click your way virtually, through Nagoro, it's as if time has frozen. Dolls can be seen partaking in various day-to-day -day activities. Children with hopeful eyes wait in classrooms. Fishermen stand poised by the river with rods in hand. 
farmers seem engrossed in their chores, and some dolls appear to be in mid-conversation with one another by the road. While these figures might give an illusion of a bustling hamlet, however, the absence of human chatter, laughter, or even whispers, is starkly evident. A visitor might wander for hours, entranced by the surreal atmosphere, without encountering a single living inhabitant. The unique allure of Nagoro has not escaped global attention. Thanks to the power of the internet, word has spread about this eerie and enchanting village, drawing curious travelers from far and wide. Today, Nagoro is more than just a village. It's an open-air museum, a testament to Ayano's artistic genius. For those visiting, it's recommended to embark on a taxi tour, not only to navigate the maze-like roads, but to ensure no doll, each a chapter of Nagoro's rich tapestry, is overlooked. Moreover, Ayano's influence is spilling beyond the boundaries of Nagoro. Inspired by the worldwide acclaim of her dolls, similar figures have started to appear in other parts of Tokushima, infusing life and stories into otherwise mundane settings. Each season sees the dolls of Nagoro dressed in different attire, from summer dresses to hand-knitted jumpers. Beyond the surface-level intrigue, Nagoro poignantly symbolizes the global phenomenon of rural depopulation and urban migration. It stands as a silent chronicle of changing times, a heart-rending homage to those who once lived there, and an ode to human resilience and creativity in the face of overwhelming change. Number 6. The Booger Holler Bridge Nestled in the old mill town of Cherokee Falls is a tale, steeped in the American past, that sends shivers down the spines of even the bravest souls. The near-mythical Booger Jim, an eccentric and reclusive man, was the living embodiment of the adage, every town has its secrets. Despite his off-putting demeanor, he was a husband and a father to a young infant. But beneath that facade of a family man, lurked a darkness, a monster waiting to be unleashed. According to legend, one fateful evening, a heated argument between Booger and his wife erupted. What should have been a fleeting moment of anger turned cataclysmic. Overwhelmed by fury, Booger Jim unleashed a torrent of violence upon his wife, strangling her to death. The cries of their infant son, as he witnessed the heinous act, only heightened Booger's madness. In an attempt to stifle the child's screams, Booger's monstrous nature did not spare even the innocent, and he snuffed out the life of his young son as well. Reality dawned upon him as he gazed upon the carnage he had wrought. Tormented by guilt and unable to bear the weight of his sins, Booger Jim ventured to a bridge in Cherokee Falls. In a final act of desperation, he ended his own life, hanging himself with jumper cables, the last vestiges of his humanity reflected in the crushed photograph of his family he held in his death grip. But as legend has it, death was not the end for Booger Jim. The bridge, now infamously known as Booger Jim Bridge, is believed to be the haunting ground of his restless spirit. Locals whisper of a chilling ritual. If one stands on the bridge at the stroke of midnight, switches off their car, and dares to chant, Booger Jim, thrice, they might invoke the spirit of the tormented man. Witnesses claim to have heard eerie footsteps echoing beneath the bridge, and chilling moans reminiscent of the sound of cables straining, and some have even reported sightings of malevolent, glowing red eyes lurking in the surrounding woods. Venture to the bridge on a moonless night, and you'll sense a darkness, a palpable sensation of evil, that even the brightest lights fail to dispel. The tale of Booger Jim serves as a grim reminder. Sometimes, legends are human. These tales take on a life of their own, growing and evolving with each retelling. As they echo through the ages, they transform into eerie warnings, cautioning us on the frailty of human nature and the dark shadows that lurk within. The story of Booger Jim is not just an account of one man's descent into madness, but a reflection of a sinister potential that resides in all of us. The bridge stands as a testament to the duality of humanity, where love, anger, remorse, and vengeance intertwine, legends take shape. Number 5. Ariel Castro House Google Maps provides a window to almost every nook and corner of the world, but there's some things it conceals. In Cleveland, Ohio, a typical suburban street displays all its homes, except for one notable exception, 2208 Seymour Avenue. 
On August 23, 2002, 21-year-old Michelle Knight was en route to a custody hearing for her son Joey. After leaving her cousin's home, confusion about her route made her halt at a dollar store for directions. While there, she recognized a familiar face, the father of her friend Arlene. Since he was familiar, she trusted him when he offered a ride, mentioning he had to collect his daughter. He lured her to his home with the promise of getting to look at his new puppies, knowing that Michelle was seeking a dog for Joey after a recent pet loss. Michelle agreed to the lift, a decision that would change the course of the rest of her life. She got into the car with 52-year-old Ariel Castro. Ariel Castro was born to parents Pedro Castro and Lillian Rodriguez on July 10, 1960. Growing up in Puerto Rico, he would later move to the U.S., following his parents' separation. The family first landed in Redding, Pennsylvania, and later relocated to Cleveland, Ohio, reuniting with Ariel's father and other relatives. Ariel's school years culminated with his graduation from Cleveland Lincoln West in 1979. The following decade saw Ariel's path cross with Gramilda Figueroa when her family moved nearby and they began a relationship. By the 90s, the couple had carved out a space for themselves at 2208 Seymour Avenue in Cleveland. This dwelling, a two-story affair, housed four bedrooms, a bathroom, and an expansive basement. However, this typical American narrative takes a dark turn. Alida Caraballo, Gramilda's sister, and her husband Frank painted a grim picture of Castro's violent tendencies towards Gramilda. His alleged brutalities ranged from causing a nose fracture to breaking her ribs and arms, and it's believed that such sustained abuse led to blood clots in Gramilda's brain, subsequently giving rise to a terminal tumor. Elida shared a particularly chilling story about a time Castro supposedly knocked Gramilda off a ladder, resulting in a serious head injury. While he was taken into custody for his violent behavior in 1993, the charges didn't stick. By 1996, Gramilda, having secured custody of their four children on account of Ariel's abuse, made her exit from the Seymour Avenue residence with the help of police intervention. Yet, the charges against Castro never seemed to stick. Despite leaving him, Gramilda's torment at Castro's hands persisted. In 2005, she sought legal intervention through the Cuyahoga County Domestic Relations Court, citing numerous severe injuries and accusing him of recurrently kidnapping their daughter. While an initial order did ask Castro to steer clear of her, this was later annulled. When Michelle Knight entered Ariel Castro's residence, she quickly grasped the gravity of her mistake. Contrary to his claims, no puppies were awaiting her. What she found at the home was something far more sinister. After informing her she wouldn't be leaving anytime soon, Ariel began to disrobe. Michelle begged to be released, mentioning her responsibility towards her son. Her plea was met with heartless indifference as Ariel destroyed the sole picture she had of her son, Joey. She was initially confined to a basement pole and muzzled. Within a few months, her prison was shifted to a tiny pink-hued room upstairs. Here, she was often left in a state of undress and tethered to the walls. During her captivity, Michelle suffered continuous physical assaults at the hands of Ariel. Amanda Berry disappeared on April 21, 2003, the day before her 17th birthday. She had called her sister to let her know that she was getting a ride home from the Burger King where she worked. When her family reported her disappearance, the police assumed at first that she was a runaway. However, a week after she was last seen, a mysterious phone call was placed to her family. The person on the other end of the line stated that he had Amanda captive and would return her after a few days. However, weeks, months, and years went by before Amanda's family would know what happened to her. Almost two years after his first kidnapping, Gina DeJesus, 14, was also kidnapped by Ariel. She was last seen by family on April 2, 2004, and was known to Ariel as his daughter Arlene's best friend. Gina was his third and final victim. Gina gave Arlene 50 cents to use the payphone to call her mother to ask about a visit on their way home from middle school. After Arlene's mother declined, they parted ways. Gina typically rode the bus home, 
but she had to walk after giving Arlene the last of her money. Ariel offered Gina a ride, but instead of taking her home, he drove her back to his residence. Gina and Michelle were chained to a mattress in a small room as Ariel savagely assaulted them. As Ariel them, they sometimes held hands. The captives had two showers each week and one meal per day. Amanda became pregnant and gave birth in captivity. She named her daughter. Though her situation was horrific, Amanda saw Jocelyn as someone she and the other girls could love while they were trapped in their horrific situation. Ariel took Jocelyn out of the home to visit his mother. He told her that Jocelyn was his lover's child. Michelle fell pregnant five times while she was held captive by Ariel. To prevent her from giving birth, he starved her and beat her with dumbbells. After 11 years of abuse by Ariel, she needed facial reconstructive surgery and lost hearing in one ear. More than once, the women could hear their own stories on the news as Ariel watched TV in the other room. They heard their frightened relatives asking for their safe return. All the while, the missing girls, remembered with candlelight vigils, were being held captive together. All the vigils held for the victims were attended by Ariel. His daughter Arlene appeared on the news to beg her friend Gina's kidnappers to release her. She had no idea Gina and two other girls were being held captive in her father's house. Ariel's son Anthony told his father that he believed that Amanda Berry, the missing young woman in the news, was dead. Really? Do you agree? His father asked. Anthony later reported he couldn't enter his father's basement, attic, or garage. All three were locked. Ariel enjoyed manipulating and psychologically torturing the women throughout their captivity. He sometimes left their door unlocked, but beat the women if he found them attempting to flee. He not only made them commemorate Abduction Day, but also marked their imprisonment dates in his house instead of their birthdays. Jocelyn told her mother Amanda on May 6, 2013, that Ariel wasn't home. Amanda saw her chance. She rushed to the front door and saw that Ariel had neglected to lock the main door, though the screen door remained locked. Amanda shouted for help through the screen door. Charles Ramsay, a passerby in the neighborhood, was alerted by her cries. The hysterical woman said that she and two others were being held captive in the home. Ramsey and another neighbor, Angel Cordero, kicked the door open for Amanda and Jocelyn. After being released, Amanda contacted 911 to report her abduction and that there were two other women being held in the home. Police rushed into Ariel's home. Michelle, Gina, Amanda, and Jocelyn were discharged and taken to a neighboring hospital. Finally, their terrifying ordeal was over. Ariel was apprehended that day kidnapping, and aggravated murder for forcing Michelle to miscarry were among his 977 charges. Despite his initial assertion of innocence, Ariel altered his not guilty plea to guilty on 937 of 977 counts a week after his arrest as part of a plea agreement. He gave up his right to appeal and all his property, including the house where he held the four victims. Ariel was sentenced to life without parole, plus 1,000 years on August 1, 2013. After serving just one month of his life sentence, Ariel was found dead in his cell. He had hung himself with his bedsheet. Amanda, Gina, and Michelle thanked supporters in a statement after being saved. They opened a bank account to help them adjust to life outside of imprisonment. Michelle told Good Morning Britain in 2020, I don't know what I would have done without my son trying to get home. Thoughts of her son, Joey, had helped to get her through her ordeal. However, Joey's new family insisted on keeping his identity a secret and banned him from meeting his birth mother. Instead, the family emailed Michelle updates and photos of her son. Michelle eventually fell in love, married, and wrote a book about her terrifying experience. Amanda joined Fox 8 News in Cleveland in 2017 and hosts a Missing People feature. She thanked Charles Ramsey for saving four lives in a 2019 interview. Before Google concealed it, 2208 Seymour Avenue seemed like any other house on the block. The two-story structure boasted four bedrooms, a bathroom, a 760-square-foot basement, dual porches, an attic, and a standalone garage. Its external facade hid the disturbing secrets it held within. By 2013, the city had been granted permission to destroy the home, and if you look on Street View today, you'll see nothing but a large patch of grass where this disturbing house of horrors once stood.
Number 4. Scott's Hut Ross Island in Antarctica, cloaked in its glacial mysteries, holds within it a monument to the age of polar exploration, Scott's Hut. This seemingly unassuming wooden structure carries a century-old tale of heroism, hope, tragedy, and the relentless human pursuit of the unknown. The dawn of the 20th century saw explorers, filled with the fervor of adventure, charting their way into the heart of Antarctica. The ambition? To plant their nation's flag at the South Pole, a place no human had yet reached. Two teams, in particular, entered this perilous race. The Norwegian team led by the indomitable Roald Amundsen and the British contingent under the tenacious Robert Falcon Scott. The seasoned explorer Robert Scott had previously spearheaded the Discovery Expedition between 1901 and 1904. This venture saw Scott, Ernest Shackleton, and Edward Wilson inch closer to the pole. They were stationed at the Discovery Hut on Ross Island, a mere shadow of the colossal McMurdo Station that would later rise nearby. During Scott's next voyage to Antarctica, the Terra Nova Expedition of 1910 to 1913, he made the bold decision to shift bases. Abandoning the Discovery Hut due to its challenging location, Scott instead set his sights on Cape Evans. A new hut, designed with innovative seaweed quilts for insulation, was erected, transforming the inhospitable environment into a warm haven. So much so that explorers often reported being uncomfortably hot inside the structure. This building was vast and spacious enough to not only house the team, but also the 19 Siberian ponies critical for their journey. As the chill of the winter of 1911 settled in, the hut became home to 25 souls, all with a singular goal in mind, conquering the South Pole for Britain. Their march began on the 1st of November 1911. In a strategic approach, Scott intended for teams to turn back progressively, with the final push to the pole being made by the remaining four men. However, by January 4th, 1912, Scott decided that five men would venture forth to the pole. The goal seemed within grasp, only 167 miles away. Yet, upon reaching their destination on 17th of January 1912, the British team was met with a disheartening sight, the Norwegian flag fluttering boldly. Amundsen's team had outpaced them by a mere five weeks. The grueling journey back was marred by tragedies. Edgar Evans succumbed to injuries. Oates walked into a snowstorm never to return, and the rest of the men fought through blizzards, weakening with each passing day. When they were a mere 12.5 miles from One Ton Depot, nature's fury halted them, and they never moved again. Scott's last diary entries paint a picture of hopelessness, of brave men facing their inevitable end. We shall stick it out to the end, he wrote, and they did. The bodies of Scott and his team were discovered on 12th of November 1912, over time, as heroes turned into legends, debates began to arise, scrutinizing Scott's decisions. Was it tactical error or mere misfortune that caused the losses? The discourse swayed over time, but the respect for their endeavor remained undiminished. Scott's hut stands today as a testament to this journey. Abandoned in 1917, the hut offered refuge to stranded members of Ernest Shackleton's Ross Sea Party in 1915. Today, after being rediscovered and preserved, it stands as a window into the past. Almost untouched by time, thanks to the relentless cold outside, the hut offers glimpses of an era when bravery knew no bounds. Inside, thanks to Google Maps, you can still see the remnants of the lives of the original explorers, well-preserved interiors, frozen food that might still be consumed, and an aura that takes you back a century. A modern explorer stepping into the hut could almost hear the whispers of plans, strategies, hopes, and dreams. In this silent corner of the frozen continent, Scott's hut stands not just as a structure, but as a monument to human spirit, ambition, and sacrifice. It remains a poignant reminder of what man can achieve, the prices paid for glory, and the stories that become immortal with time. Number 3. The Kazakhstan Pentagram In the expansive plains of central Kazakhstan, there lies a mysterious pentagram carved into the earth, easily visible via satellite imagery platforms like Google Maps. This vast five-pointed star, surrounded by a bold circle, is situated along the southern fringes of the upper Tobol Reservoir. It stands solitary, 
in a region with minimal traces of human activity, with the closest urban center, Lysakovsk, situated about 12 miles or 20 kilometers to its east. Lysakovsk and its neighboring territories are rich tapestries of history. The landscape is dotted with relics from the past, including ancient settlements from the Bronze Age, unexplored graveyards and burial mounds, silently narrating tales from millennia ago. This isolated and unique pentagram has naturally become a topic of much speculation and debate online. The symbolism of the pentagram has fueled various theories, ranging from connections to satanic cults and mystical sect to speculations about extraterrestrial involvement. Adding layers to this mystery, zooming in on the satellite imagery reveals two words within the pentagram, reading Adam and Lucifer. These names, particularly Lucifer, have strong religious and mythological undertones, further fanning the flames of conjecture. The pentagram, throughout history, has held myriad meanings and has been affiliated with numerous cultures and spiritual beliefs. It has been revered by diverse groups from the Mesopotamians and Pythagoreans to Christians, Freemasons, and even modern-day Wiccan traditions. Contrary to what some believe, not all interpretations of this symbol are dark or malevolent in nature. A potential interpretation of the Kazakh pentagram comes from Emma Usmanova, an expert archaeologist well acquainted with the region. She offers that the distinctive shape is merely the design of a park, structured to look like a star. His historically, the star held significant meaning in the Soviet Union, which Kazakhstan was a part of until its dissolution in 1991. The star motif was omnipresent, adorning flags, edifices, and public monuments, encapsulating the various ideals of the Soviet Union. Some believe that this particular star could trace its roots back to a Soviet lakeside resort, now lying in neglect. Usmanova further adds that the crisp, distinct lines of the star are formed by roads flanked by trees, which, over time, have created a dense perimeter, making the star stand out prominently when viewed from above. Number 2. Trementina Base Deep in the heart of the New Mexico desert lies a top-secret Scientology base known as the Trementina Base. This facility, which remained elusive to the public eye for years, recently came into the spotlight due to some remarkable aerial photographs made available on Google Earth. These images seem to illustrate what many refer to as the Church of Scientology's Alien Space Cathedral, a mysterious building connected to an underground vault. Next to this structure are two distinct symbols carved into the ground, what looks to be two Venn diagrams, each featuring a diamond within. These markings are believed to be trademarked by the Church of Technology, a branch of Scientology. The prevailing theory is that these symbols act as a return point for Scientology followers, guiding them back from the ends of the universe after a theorized future cataclysmic event destroys humanity. Within this context, these markers would specifically help members locate the works of L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, upon their return. Founded in 1953 by American science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard, the Church of Scientology holds some unique beliefs. Hubbard wrote of an ancient event where an alien ruler named Xi Nu transported billions of beings called Thetans to Earth only to obliterate them with the spirits of these beings, he proposed, now drift around the planet causing harm to the living. Through the practices of Scientology, followers can cleanse themselves of these spirits. The Church defines itself as a religion focused on the study of the spirit concerning oneself, others, and life as a whole. Adherents aim to confirm their spiritual existence and understand their relationship with the Supreme Being or God. The ultimate goal for followers is to achieve a state called clear in Dianetics, signifying freedom from the negative impacts of the reactive mind. Following this, members aim to climb up operating Thetan levels with full revelation of Scientology's truths at the eighth level. For reference, achieving this level reportedly cost actor Tom Cruise five years and a hundred thousand dollars. Inside the Trementina base, behind a three-story house, are tunnels dug deep into the rock. These tunnels are said to house Hubbard's teachings. The expansive complex, which spans 50-60 acres in the middle of the desert, also features a house-like structure built into the side of a mountain, a mile-long landing strip, water storage units, and several RV trailers. 
All of this is located about 20 miles west of the nearest city, Las Vegas, New Mexico. Recent observations suggest minimal occupancy, as only a solitary dog was seen patrolling the grounds. Tim Galagos, an ex-police chief, is believed to be the only non-Scientologist to have ever toured the facility. He shared that within its stone confines are machines designed for copying Hubbard's works, and that the vault resembles a massive time capsule containing the church's sacred scriptures. While he didn't witness anything overtly sinister, he did feel a sense that secrets remained concealed, and he was not granted access to certain areas. The alien space cathedral is said to have been constructed underground, a project that was undertaken in the 1980s and reportedly cost millions of dollars. John Sweeney, a BBC journalist, in his book, The Church of Fear, Inside the Weird World of Scientology, wrote that he was informed that the vault stored Hubbard's lectures on gold discs, sealed within argon-filled titanium caskets. Additionally, the entire facility is purportedly designed to withstand a nuclear explosion, with its entrance protected by massive stainless steel airlocks. This secretive facility, with its deep vaults and distinctive symbols, remains a mystery, with its true purpose and inner workings known only to a select few. However, in the age of technology, tools like Google Earth have democratized access to information, allowing the curious and the skeptical alike a glimpse into otherwise hidden places. The satellite imagery from platforms like Google Earth has, in essence, pulled back the veil on such clandestine locations, challenging the bounds of secrecy and stirring public intrigue about the mysterious church's activities within this desert sanctuary. Number 1. Skinwalker Ranch The American Southwest holds many mysteries, but few are as perplexing and widely discussed as the enigmatic Skinwalker Ranch in northeastern Utah. Nestled within the Uinta Basin, a region defined by a rich history of folklore and contemporary reports of the unexplained, this ranch has earned a reputation as one of the most intensely studied paranormal hotspots in the world. The tales associated with this 500-acre ranch span centuries, involving shape-shifting witches, unidentified flying object sightings, and paranormal activities that baffle even the most skeptical minds. Skinwalker Ranch gets its sinister name from its deep-rooted history with the indigenous inhabitants of the region. Located on land traditionally belonging to the Ute tribe, the term Skinwalker derives from Navajo folklore. In Navajo culture, skinwalkers are malevolent entities believed to have the power to transform into animals or other humans. While the skinwalker legend is an intricate aspect of Navajo belief, fragments of its tales have permeated into mainstream culture, giving rise to various chilling stories. One such tale intertwines the legends of the Navajo with those of the Utes. The legend speaks of a time when the Navajo unleashed skinwalkers upon the Ute tribe during a period of strife. And as the stories go, these very skinwalkers continue to roam the lands of the Winta Basin to this day. In 1994, the Sherman family, unaware of the ominous legends, purchased Skinwalker Ranch, hoping for a peaceful life in their new rustic home. But peace was not what awaited them. Over the years, they experienced a series of unnerving events that defied logical explanation. One night, Terry Sherman encountered a giant wolf on his property. In a desperate attempt to protect his family, he shot at it multiple times. Astonishingly, the bullets seemed to have no effect. To make things even more bizarre, the wolf's tracks mysteriously vanished as Terry pursued it. The wolf's supernatural demeanor and its uncanny disappearance begged the question, could this creature have been a manifestation of the ancient skinwalker legends? But that wasn't all. The Shermans reported witnessing inexplicable lights in the sky, eerie voices that seemed to hover above them, unexplained patterns in their fields, and chilling cattle mutilations. Driven to the brink, the Shermans sold the ranch in 1996, desperate to escape the inexplicable horrors. Enter Robert Bigelow, an eccentric millionaire with an insatiable curiosity for the unknown. In 1996, having established the National Institute for Discovery Science, NADSCI, the previous year, Bigelow purchased the ranch. 
Instead of fearing the mysteries of Skinwalker Ranch, he embraced them, converting the ranch into a center for paranormal research. Under Nidsey's purview, researchers documented numerous unexplained occurrences. They reported seeing bizarre creatures, encountering cattle mutilations, and experiencing equipment malfunctions, despite their state-of-the-art gear. These reports further cemented the ranch's reputation as a hotspot for paranormal activity. Despite significant investments and numerous investigations, Nidsey disbanded in 2004 without revealing any earth-shattering discoveries. The property remained under their control until 2016, when it changed hands to another group keen on uncovering its secrets. Utah real estate magnate Brandon Fugel revealed himself as the ranch's new owner. Alongside the announcement came the launch of a History Channel reality TV series, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. This show aimed to document the scientific exploration of the ranch's mysteries, bringing a fresh perspective to age-old tales. Much like their predecessors, Fugel's team faced numerous inexplicable phenomena, from malfunctioning equipment to unexplained health ailments. And yes, among the staff was a security expert with the striking name of Dragon. What is truly happening at Skinwalker Ranch? Several theories have been posited, from elaborate hoaxes for financial gain to extraterrestrial and interdimensional visitors. One prevailing perspective is rooted in skepticism, suggesting that the stories about the ranch are exaggerated or fabricated to capitalize on potential investments and marketing opportunities. This theory argues that narratives surrounding supernatural occurrences can inflate the property's value and draw attention that can be turned into financial benefits through tourism or media deals. The basis for this is what seems to be coincidental timing of claims of mysterious activity and potential financial or media attention. However, a counter to this is that the selling price of the ranch wasn't unusually high, indicating that the Shermans may not have been primarily motivated by immediate financial gain. Another popular theory is that Skinwalker Ranch is a focal point for extraterrestrial activity, possibly even an alien base. This belief is bolstered by the numerous reports of unidentified flying object sightings, mysterious airborne lights, and strange technological malfunctions. Moreover, the cattle mutilations reported on the ranch, noted for their inexplicable precision, have been argued to be the handiwork of advanced extraterrestrial beings. However, skeptics often question why extraterrestrial beings would center so much of their activity on just one area, especially if they wanted to remain hidden from human observation. Building on the idea of otherworldly visitors, some posit that the observed phenomena are not from beings from another planet, but rather entities or forces from a parallel universe or another dimension. This theory draws on accounts of apparent doorways or portals that have appeared in the sky over the ranch, which might suggest entry or exit points from other dimensions. Additionally, the sudden appearance and disappearance of creatures and other events could be indicative of interdimensional travel. Nevertheless, the very concept of interdimensional travel is highly theoretical, with current scientific understanding offering no concrete evidence of parallel dimensions intersecting with our own. A more grounded explanation proposes that geological or geomagnetic processes inherent to the ranch's land might influence human perception, leading to hallucinations or altered states of of consciousness. Michael Persinger, a neuroscientist, once theorized that geomagnetic fields could potentially influence the human brain, particularly the temporal lobes, resulting in experiences perceived as paranormal. Around the world, there are places labeled window areas where heightened paranormal activity is reported. It's speculated by some researchers that there might be a geomagnetic or geological reason for this. However, this theory struggles to account for tangible evidence, such as unexplained cattle mutilations or the malfunctions of electronic equipment. Yet another perspective points to the possibility of military testing as the root of the strange occurrences. Given the history of secret U.S. government projects, like those associated with Area 51, it's not a stretch to imagine the phenomena as stemming from experimental aircraft, weaponry, or even psychological testing. The sightings of unidentifiable aircraft and unexplained phenomena could align with experimental technology being tested in remote areas. 
However, this explanation seems unlikely to many, given the sheer variety of phenomena reported over such a long duration. Moreover, conducting such evident tests in areas where civilians can easily notice would be a high-risk move for the military, especially as Skinwalker Ranch has become more renowned as a hotspot for such activity. Lastly, considering the ranch's location in areas historically inhabited by the Ute tribe and near Navajo territories, there are beliefs that the land may be under the influence of Native American curses or that it holds unique spiritual significance. The legend of the Skinwalker, a malevolent being in Navajo tradition, is central to this theory. Both the Navajo and the Ute have tales and beliefs about the area that precede modern reports of paranormal activity. However, some argue that this theory might oversimplify or misconstrue Native American beliefs and legends. In the end, the true nature of the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch remains one of the modern world's great mysteries, with each theory potentially explaining a piece of the puzzle but none providing a comprehensive explanation. Today, while public access to Skinwalker Ranch remains restricted, the allure of its tales continues to captivate. For those keen to experience a hint of its mystique, nearby campsites offer unidentified flying object-themed tours, and local state parks provide stargazing opportunities. As to what truly lies at the heart of Skinwalker Ranch's mysteries, the search continues. One thing is for certain, the Uinta Basin, with its rich history and stunning landscapes, remains a beacon for both the curious and the brave.